Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the invitation to speak. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, in this very nice program. So I'm going to talk about holography in a setup that we are not normally used to, or at least I'm not normally used to. So the most standard setup where we think about holography, or maybe two big examples of things we do with holography, is one compute amplitudes. For example, this could be the boundary of ADS, and we could be drawing Witten diagrams where a particle propagates from one point in the boundary to another. Or perhaps we have a bunch of particles and they start interacting. So that's an example of computations. We have a synthot we have ADS space and we put some probes inside ADS. There is another different type of computation we often do, let me draw it here, where we have ADS, say in global coordinates. So that's a cylinder. And we consider, say, a black hole, a very heavy operator that lies here somewhere in global ADS, and this would be here, some black hole state. And then we do thermodynamics, we study entropies of these black holes, and so on. Now, one thing we could ask is how do I study correlation functions in holography for operators that become extremely large, that they become as large as the operators that would create these black holes that we are used to? So what should I do if I want to say a study a three-point function where each of these operators is a black hole? Or each of these operators is heavy enough to deform the geometry? And the basic idea that uh, uh, we have been exploring with Jacob, Francesco, and Rob is the idea that what happens is that you should think of some kind of fat version of these Witten diagrams where what will happen is that the geometry is approximately ADS if you are far away from the insertion points, or if you are close to the boundary here, say, far away from the insertion points. But otherwise, this would be where the geodesic would be. There will be some banana-like shape. And here, we have the banana. And here, in this side, this would be generalized to what would be a three-legged banana. Now, what is a three-legged banana? How does it show up? What's the topology of this three-legged banana? How should we think of these objects? How should we compute with them? These are the kind of things that I would like to speculate a little bit about. Most of the time, I'll be talking about the two-point function about understanding this banana. In Euclidean space. So the idea is that here we have Rd. So we just want to take Rd and put three huge operators that create a black hole. <laughs> so the kind of questions, of course, we aim at answering in the future is how relevant are the microstates that we use to prepare the heavy operator? Do we get universality? Does it matter when we have, say, heavy, heavy, light, light? Does it matter how different the two heavy operators are? And so on and so forth. So we want to set that up. And first, we want to understand how to holographically, how from a gravity point of view, do we describe these solutions where we have these banana black holes versus the more standard, what we would call the global, just global Schwarzschild black holes. Okay. So the idea, <clears throat> the, the intuition for going from this picture here, which we would call, as I said, global, to the next picture that I'm going to draw here, that I'm going to call the cone, was actually inspired by a nice paper by Romuald Yannick. So Yannick was answering, was asking a similar question, not for such heavy operators, but for strings. He was also saying, in integrability, we are always tired of studying rotating strings in the middle of ADS. We study their energies, we quantize them, we get these nice rigid trajectories that uh, Eric was talking about. But what we do with the computer dimensions of these operators is we compute the energy in global ADS. But that should be a way of also thinking of some kind of fat Witten diagram, of stringy Witten diagram, where you send a string that rotates a lot and then goes from one point to the other. And so he found a bunch of non-unitary transformations. And in practice, at the end of the day, when you start with Lorentzian ADS, and you want to ask, how do I go from this Lorentzian picture to the Euclidean picture, 
At the end of, a, after a few transformations, the key transformation you have to do, I wrote it up here, but I'm going to write it again. Blah. So we start with Schwarzschild up here on the up uh, corner. So we have the usual Schwarzschild in the dimensions in global EDS. R is the radial direction, so we have R here. We have time here, Euclidean time, or if you want Lorentzian time t, but there I wrote already with Euclidean. And then we have a sphere here, a rotation here. And the idea is to consider this radial map where you say that R is going to become R over Z, which means that this constant R black hole is now going to be, in this picture, a cone. And if I consider going away from this cone, drawing this line, I would go all the way like this. And then, the, this is how this radial coordinate works. And then time here, e to the tau, is related to the distance from the tip of the cone, r squared plus z squared, so that traveling along the black hole here is traveling along this cone. <clears throat> okay. And so this is how we would start with a metric in global EDS. We could start in Lorentzian. First step, you weak rotate t to i tau. Now you are in Euclidean. And after you rotate, you do this change of variable in this first yellow box. And you go to this cone metric, which would be some metric where now we foliate things not with concentric cylinders, but with concentric, with uh, this opening more and more wide cones. And now, of course, what we could do is take this metric where the operators would be inserted one at zero, one at infinity, and just apply an ADS isometry, which now, because the metric is not just ADS, it is an honest change of variable. And now we would go to the metric of the banana where the cone is mapped to a banana. And now we would have a point inserted at, say, zero, and one point inserted at x. So, sorry, the yes. Yeah, we are in the dimensions, but uh, yeah. Okay, S D minus one takes S one. Yes. Um, but didn't you want to find correlation functions just on R D? That's right. So okay. here we are in R D, so this boundary here is R D. So by doing this change of variables, we went from that frame to this frame where the boundary now is R D. Ah, okay, so you are worried about the S1. So let me m emphasize that point, that normally what we do when we consider the Euclidean black hole is that we make this circle periodic, and we consider finite temperature, and the temperature is dictated by not having a singularity at the horizon, and that's what we normally do. Now here, I am not doing this identification. That's right. So now, let's suppose we want to ask if this is the end result. So we would ask, let's compute the action, the gravitational action, for the banana. And see what do we get. Right? So we take the banana, let's evaluate this action. Now, what should we do? We are doing holography, so what we should do is we should cut off this geometry, some epsilon away here. So we put some regulator here, and we say, I'm going to consider the geometry up to some surface epsilon at z equal epsilon, the usual thing. <laughs> and then, uh, what, do, what should we do? So, we, if we translate back to what it means here, it would mean that we would consider going from this point all the way to this point here would correspond to traveling a certain amount from here to here. And this height that we would integrate would be delta tau, and this delta tau would be related to the separation of the banana by something like this. 
I would separate. The separation of the points would dictate by how much you should evolve in the black hole. And then, what is the usual way of computing these actions that when we study thermodynamics, we compute the bulk action and we have a boundary, which is ADS. So we also put at the boundary, let me draw this yellow line, we also put here some gibbon Hawking's term for the boundary. So we evaluate the bulk and we compute this gibbon Hawking's term. What would it translate here in the banana? I'm computing the bulk action and I should put a gibbon Hawking's term here in the bound in, in ADS. Now, if we do this computation, we all did this computation of thermodynamics, when we compute the gravity action with this given Hawking's term and we compute it, as Shiraz said, normally we identify this with some temperature beta. So what is the answer? The answer is just exponential of minus beta, but beta here is delta tau. So this delta tau is usually beta because the action is invariant, it's translation invariant, so whatever interval I compute is just multiplied by that interval, multiplied by the free energy, which is the energy of the black hole, minus the inverse temperature times uh, the entropy. Yeah, oh, sorry. Right? And so, this is what we would normally get, and this would become, under that identification, up to some normalization, 1 over x to the power twice the energy minus t times the energy. Sorry. <laughs> we want to compute exponential of minus the action, and that would give me this. Right? And so we would see that the correlation function would become 1 over x squared to the power of the energy minus the entropy. And this is wrong. This is not what we want. So this is not what we want, which is 1 over x to the power of the energy of just the mass of the object I put there. And so how should we correctly do this computation? It's related to what Shiraz said, that this space, as we don't identify this space is singular there. So actually, if you look at the banana, you see that you have this banana that touches the boundary, touches this surface E at epsilon. So the boundary of your space that you thought first was just epsilon, now it's pierced by this banana, so you better consider the surface of the banana as also part of your boundary. And so the idea is that actually the boundary of the space is this, eps this surface at z equal epsilon, not the boundary, plus the peel of the banana, right? So you have to cover the banana, and you have to consider the boundary to be this, and you have to add an egg, you have to put something a little bit unusual. You should put some given Hawking's term here. That you can show that if you evaluate what this given Hawking's term does here, is kill this entropy term. And so the, 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 the proposal, in other words, is that if you were to translate back to this computation, even here, you could ask, how do I compute exponential, how do I compute the evolution, Euclidean evolution, of black hole, exponential of Hamiltonian times tau, and then black hole? For any tau, right? I can always, for any tau, decide I want to compute, for some reason, exponential of minus tau times Hamiltonian, acting on black hole, absorbing black hole. And I should get e to the minus energy times tau, without entropy, without anything. So I want to change ensemble. I want to go from fixing temperature and uh, having all this entropy to just saying I fix the state and I have one state and I want to just reproduce e to the minus energy times tau. And the claim is that this boundary term precisely does that. And, if you, and uh, similarly, if we were to study black holes with charge, we would also put a boundary term to fix the charge versus the chemical potential and so on. In the original picture, it would be that you would also consider a gibbon Hawking's term now. You would put a stretched horizon, and you would also put a gibbon Hawking's term at the stretched horizon. And now the, and the claim is that if you wrap now this stretched horizon with a gibbon Hawking's term, you are computing exponential of minus the energy of the state times time without the entropy. Now, Actually, to do properly the computation, 
<coughs> it's often useful to think of an even better cone and an even better banana. So we call it the improved cone and the improved banana. So let me just say what it is. It's something very simple. If you just follow the transformation there on top, you go from global to the cone, you see that that cone metric is a little bit funny. It has cross turns, DZDR, it has some funny form. It is not of the usual Pfefferham gram form. It is not of the usual form that it is ADS plus stress tension DX DX plus dot dot dot. So you could ask, can I do a change of variables to make it into the more standard holographic normalization form, where I have ADS plus stress tensor plus corrections to that. And you can. So that's what is given in the second equal sign. So if you go from that cone metric to this, what we call here the improved cone, then uh, there is a change of variables where you change R over Z to some new R over Z. In fact, it's a very messy transformation that uh, we found in perturbation theory, and we saw that the metric resummed into this nice metric. I think we actually only know the explicit expression for this mess in three dimensions. But in any dimension, we managed to guess what the metric is and then check that it obeys Einstein equations. And this would be the improved cone, where in this last metric here, this nice metric, if you expand close to the boundary, you do get ADS plus stress tensor plus etc. Yes? OK, maybe you could show me uh, later. Yeah. No, of course, now that we know this change of variable, we can find the map in some dimensions directly from Schwarzschild to this. We don't know this map, I think, in general, indeed, not equal to 3. But, uh, not with that with Z, right? With this cone foliation, I'm not sure it exists. But uh, I'm happy to, to, to have a look later. If you show, me, if you show us, that would be great. Now, let me make a few comments about this cone metric and this improved cone. So first of all, strictly speaking, what I said before about doing the usual renormalization with epsilon, I should do it in the improved cone. It's in the improved cone that I have Pfefferham gram. So when I said put the cutoff at epsilon, it should, strictly speaking, put the cutoff at epsilon in this good metric. Okay, so I oversimplified a little bit. That's the first comment. But the second comment is that uh, right now, I mean, I call it really the improved cone in quotation marks, because this improved cone has a big drawback. It has a big advantage. Boundary conditions are manifest. It is Pfefferham gram. It has a big drawback. It's not complete. So this metric doesn't go all the way to the horizon. So let's, let me describe what happens. <clears throat> and I'm just closing this discussion because this is going to be relevant as we go to three points. And so the basic idea is that this improved cone, let's put in quotation improved, It has this very nice feature. Pfefferham gram is great, but it's not complete. Whereas the original cone is the opposite. Pfefferham gram is not okay, but it is a nice metric that you can go all the way to the horizon. <coughs> so this metric you cannot. It's easy to see that if you check this improved metric, that there is a cone There is a cone here where the determinant of the metric equal to zero. And this happens at, if you trace back to global coordinates, at some R star that is bigger than the horizon. For example, I know, we know by, I know by heart that if you are in three dimensions, this R star is square root of m, and the horizon is square root of m minus 1. Okay. So R star is bigger than R H. And so you have this cone and the matrix. This improved cone is a good metric here, but if you want to go inside this statue, you have to complete this metric. And the honest horizon is somewhere here inside. Okay. And so here is where there is this black hole horizon. <clears throat> and this is going to be a generic feature because now that we know, now, now the idea for studying higher point correlation functions is you have to study a geometry. And you know the boundary conditions close to each puncture, is this Pfefferham gram. And so close to each puncture, you will have a banana tip. And that banana tip is not going to be complete. It's going to hide the black hole a little bit inside. 
And so this is going to be a generic feature that as we go from this picture to three points, we will now get some kind of three-legged wall. So there will be here some wall. And the honest black holes would be somewhere here inside. And we want to ask what happens here. And you have to understand how to complete this geometry and how to go inside. <clears throat> Any question here? Mm -hmm. I'm having trouble to understand this banana still. Like, could you draw a picture for two dimensional space time? Two? Oh, I will go to three dimensions. <laughs> That's how much I'm willing to simplify it. Two? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I'm willing to say they are fitting pictures. So I think let me highlight something funny about this, about this banana. Of course, these are just coordinates at this point. But it's worth highlighting that, of course, going around the black hole means going around the cone, which means here in the banana going around the banana, right? And if you measure the length of this geodesic, it would be 2 pi r h. It would be in three dimensions, or in general, it will be related to the area of the black hole. But going along this direction here, if we are at the black hole horizon, or very close to the black hole horizon, this distance is null. And so similarly, if I go, if I travel along the banana in this direction, I'm traveling along a null distance. So in that sense, it's a little bit funny. It's really like the tip of the cigar, the end of space. The space ends at the banana. There is no inside of the banana. So the banana is where space ends. And indeed, we don't even go close to the banana. We put the peel and we go to the stretched horizon, which is right nearby the banana, but we don't try to go inside the banana. Anyway, yeah. So now there are two things we could do at this point that I think would be fun to do. One, one thing we could do, now that we have this set up, is study things like heavy, heavy, light, light, etc. Now think I have the banana, this is the background, and I can put probes and do stuff like this. So that's one thing, I'm not going to discuss this. I mean, we did some nice things, and if you want, you can ask me the questions. And the other thing is to try to understand what happens when we have, say, three black holes, and that's more challenging. And three black holes, the thing to say is that it would be fantastic to develop some procedure to find these solutions. And I don't see a way to do it right now, which is not numerical. But I would be very happy to think, how could we ever do this uh, uh, analytically, of course. Yeah? So that seems pretty that's prevented by topological There are no three solutions of three huge black holes? Black holes. Sorry? Even two black holes in, in three. Lorentzian. Yeah, this is Euclidean. Here it's... Uh, I mean, should they, I mean, I should be able to compute the dual of a 2.500 of two heavy operators, right? It's, it must be some deformation of this Euclidean geometry. Right? OK. <clears throat> OK, so by the way, of course, this works for any solution. If you have a solution that you know how to put in global EDS, you just do this change of variables. And the claim is that if, they, you, have, if you have this spherical symmetry and so on, it's always going to work. It's always going to give you just what you expect, which is the energy of the solution to the power of the distance. So it's not, for example, we tested it on other solutions that are not black holes, like LLM geometries and so on. It, it works as well. So I think it should work for a star. But uh, I, yeah, I asked uh, Eric, and Eric said, you told him there are some nice papers about stars, these boson stars in EDS. I started looking uh, at it. So we did some examples. We have some examples of some solutions that are a little bit like stars. Yeah. The main difference is that in some of these solutions, you can go all the way to the center of the geometry, and then you don't need any, you don't need this new stuff of the given knockings at the horizon. You have no horizon, and you just go all the way to the center. And then you automatically get the energy of the star times uh, the distance. OK, so three black holes is hard. And so the idea is to consider three dimensions where we can make some progress because gravity is much simpler in three dimensions. And so the idea now is to move to three dimensions. And moving to three dimensions, the claim 
is that it's actually very easy, and I wrote it here. So let me flash what I wrote already. So again, we start with Schwarzschild. We went to the cone. We found this improved cone that is improved but not complete. And then you see that when d is equal to 2, this improved cone simplifies a lot. This term disappears. This term, when d is equal to 2, is just linear. And in fact, this metric, when d is equal to 2, is a famous metric. It's called the Banyados metric. So the Banyados metric is a metric, it's a beautiful completion of ADS, where you write ADS, you put the stress tensor, L and L bar, and then uh, there is this beautiful thing that you start with Pfefferham gram form, and to go up, you just put z squared times L L bar. It's a very simple, yeah. It's a very simple completion into the bulk that truncates, and you just add this z squared, where this L and L bar are the stress tensors for the two-point function. If I put a point at zero, a point at infinity, they would be just one over W squared, M over W squared. And so this has the right boundary conditions. This is not complete. The determinant of this is zero at some cone. To go inside, we would, do, we would undo this improvement and uh, go undo what, uh, undo what we did. But now it becomes obvious what we should do if we want to go to three points. We should just take this same metric and replace L by the corresponding L of the three-point function. And now the L of the three-point function, it is just some function that instead of having two poles, now you have three poles at three locations. And then there would be this surface that hides the black hole, some 3D shape that hides the black hole, and the black holes will be somewhere inside. And now we want to complete this solution and look inside these horizons and see what the geometry looks like. <clears throat> now, we don't know how to do this in this sense of just finding the, the analog of the inverse of this transformation to go to some coordinates that still look like this. But in ADS3, there is another way of completing the solutions, which is by, by realizing that they are just identifications of empty ADS. And so that's another way of completing, noticing that this solution with this L and L bar is just empty ADS with identifications that are given by what's called the Roberts map that Roberts found that sends this Banyados metric into empty ADS. And the idea is that these capital variables where you have empty ADS, close to the boundary when z is equal to zero, they are given by z goes to the boundary, w is f of w, w bar is f bar of w bar where this f and f bar obey some Schwarzschild equation that relates them to L and L bar. So we know how to find this f and f bar. And then there is some complicated correction that you need to put if you want really the full map from uh, Banyados to empty ADS. And so <coughs> let's discuss a little bit uh, this, uh, this map. And let's first do it for the two-point function. So for the two-point function, this map that sends you to Banyados to empty ADS, if you are studying a black hole, this F of W is W to the power of square root of M minus 1. Okay, And F bar is the conjugate function. And so let me highlight something very simple but very important, which is that dilatations in W are now rotations in F of W, which close to the boundary is capital W. So rotations in this W are dilatations, and dilatations here are rotations here. Right? So it swaps what we call dilatations and rotations. And so if we start in the cone picture, so if I start in W, now this W, here I'm in two dimensions, so these coordinates here would be the W plane, this is the W plane. And if I make dilatations in this cone, I'm rotating in that W. And if I'm rotating in this cone, I'm making a dilatation in that W. And therefore, because rotations here are dilatations there, it means that in W space, the fundamental domain should be an annulus, where going around the geometry, this line A, would correspond to traveling from one point of the annulus to the other. <clears throat> but going from zero to infinity, say 
from 0 to infinity, this line B, or the projection here into the boundary B, traveling from 0 to infinity, would now correspond to rotating. And so B would correspond to rotating. And you want to go from one point of the cone to the other, so you need to be able to rotate infinitely many times. And so that gives rise to the importance of the door. We need to put a door here. And now, as you rotate, you cross and you, you go as many times as you want, and this is what B is. And so there is this idea that we need here to put the door. So in 3D, if you think now not just at the boundary, you have two concentric domes. The black hole horizon is some line here. <clears throat> and then there is a door here. And in this picture, and that 3D line B is some line that goes around here. So going around like this is traveling along the cone of the black hole while doing some circle around the black hole. This A would be traveling from one point of the dome to the other. Okay. And so you need this picture where you have these domes and this door. And now we can immediately ask, so what happens now for three points? For three points, the map is more complicated. It's what's called the Schwartz Triangle Map. So I'll just tell you what the domes are and what the picture is at the end of the day. And so the claim is that for three points, here is the picture. For three points, so first of all, like here, when I put two domes concentric, it's a choice. There are many fundamental domains I can choose. I'm going to write one choice. There are um, more choices. So one choice, the fundamental domain looks like this. I'm just drawing the circles at the boundary. Each of these circles is a dome. It's a spherical dome. And then uh, they are identified as here, that this dome is identified with this dome. And there are doors. And there is a door here. There is a door here. And there is a door here. And so the claim is that you have a room with three doors. So each of these doors is right, a three-dimensional door. Here is one door. Here is the other door. And here is the other door. And so the picture, the claim is that this picture, if you apply the Schwarz triangle map, this is where you end up with. And now let's interpret what this picture is doing. Now, what happens with this picture is that you see that if you are at the boundary, what can you do? Or if you are in this geometry, what can you do? You can go through the door. But you can go through any of these three doors, and you can actually enter the door through one direction or through other direction. So there are six options. You are in this room, and you can enter each of the three doors through this one side or through the other. When you enter a door, suppose I enter this door, then uh, what you see after you enter the door, you enter this door. Now you are on the other side of the door. You are here. And you see nothing else. You enter in this room. And in this room, the other doors are not there. These other doors are not there. So you have a room with three doors. You enter a door. And now you are in a room that only has the door that you just came through. Right? And so that's the picture, the global picture. You have three doors. You can enter each of the doors through any of the directions. And when you enter, you see a room which only has that door. And the claim is that this is describing a wormhole. So the picture is that you see that here in this picture, there is an inside region. And there is an outside region in the boundary. Right? And if I allow myself to travel through the bulk, it's fine. I can just go up and pass by the wall and go from in to out. But if I stay inside, if I stay in this region in the boundary, I cannot connect to the outside. Similarly, if I stay on the outside at the boundary, I cannot connect to the inside. I need to go through the bulk to connect from inside to outside. And so the picture of what's happening is that you have this central room, which is like the wormhole. 
And then as you enter each of the doors, now you are going to the leg of the black hole. And so the picture, what this picture is describing in banana language, is actually that you have your three bananas, but they are somehow connect, they are connecting to, a diff, to another side, and this is the jump. And you clearly, if you are in this middle room, you have six options. You can go up or down here, you can go up or down here, and you can go up and down here. And this would correspond to going through these doors any number of times. Now this picture, it's nice to think what happens as the black holes become light. So let me conclude with that. So what happens when M decreases is that these circles collide. So the first thing that happens when M decreases is that these two circles, that there was a door between them, now collide. And we get a picture, let me collide all of them. So the door was stretching between these two. And now they collide, and this point is identified with this one. And the intersection of the two domes is some geodesic that travels from the inside of the wormhole to the outside. These two guys, the door that was here now becomes again this defect-like object that travels from this side to this side. And similarly, the door that is here now becomes this defect that travels from inside to outside. So again, there is a wormhole, but now what were the doors become defects that travel from inside to the outside, and this is the transition where the, the black holes become defects, and we have the wormhole, and this was the solution that Scott and Tom and friends studied recently, where they have the defects and the two-sided defects. And now we could shrink the mass further, and what would happen is that you would just get circles where the middle region disappears. And now you don't have double-sided. And what you have, I'm just going to draw the top picture of the geodesics, is that you will have three geodesics meeting at the point, and now you will get a single-sided solution, and this would be the solution of Cheng and Ling. And this is how the picture would interpolate. So I have one slide with a summary, and uh, where I repeat this picture with some slightly more artistic style, with some wormholes being uh, World of Warcraft portals. Oh, so let me summarize and end with some speculations about uh, higher dimensions and some questions. And something even more important that I put on the slide not to forget, and I was almost going to forget. Okay. So let me summarize. So as we go in reverse, so the idea is that when the objects are very light, when these black holes are very light, they should be just like a pebble, so they're just three particles that just meet in some geodesic in the middle. That's the picture on the left. Then, if you increase the mass of these objects, they start back reacting on the geometry, and now these three geodesics that are meeting at the optimal point, this point is moving up, and that's the solution found by Chang and Alain. They become heavier and heavier. This point that goes up, 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 it forms this portal, and you have a wormhole now. And uh, that would be the solution found uh, two years ago by um, Chandra, Collier, Hartman, and Maloney. And then, uh, as we increase the mass further, these defects become black holes, and we get these three doors, this room with three doors, plus this infinite sequence of rooms with uh, one door that I described uh, uh, today. And of course, for any parameter range, this is expected to be given universality, universally by what uh, the bootstrap predicts, which is the DOCC formula. So an obvious comment is what happens in higher dimensions. And I don't have anything very smart to say, except that, of course, it would be fantastic to develop some numerical procedure where we could look for these solutions and answer this question. What do we expect? Do we expect to find a two-sided solution or a one-sided solution? Is it something like just the three geodesics, slightly fatter, the picture? Or is it more something like the picture on the right where you have a wormhole? Or is it something more exotic? And uh, I don't know what the, the answer to this question is. Let me mention that there are two limits where the computation simplifies a lot. Very small black holes that are just geodesics, and very big black holes, very heavy black holes. If you, do, if you study very heavy black holes, the computation simplifies a lot. For example, the three-point function becomes very simply given by log of 27 over 16 times the mass of the black holes. And it will be awesome to have a geometrical interpretation for what that simple number is. And I mean, is that 27 just three to the dimension? And, <laughs> What, what, what would happen in higher dimensions? Why do we get that big number uh, there? What would it be? Let me say that 
I think that actually we could have we could have different things, even perhaps more exotic geometry-wise, and this is a bit of a crazy speculation. Besides geodesic meeting at a point, I'm just going to summarize this. Besides geodesics meeting at a point or these wormholes. <clears throat> for example, in n equals four superior mills, I would claim that we have some evidence that the picture is rather that the geometry as genus one, that uh, the geometry fragments and opens up and you get more some kind of triangle picture like this where each geometry breaks up into two and form a triangle. And that's based on a very simple computation. You can do combinatorics and there are some solutions that are protected. They don't depend on the coupling and you can use them to predict what the gravitational action should give. And if you do them for some, we did it some computation, building on some tools that Shota developed, and we got that the action for some symmetric character representations that are dual to some LLM geometries has this structure where it's a sum of tube, what we call tube that depends on JIJ, minus one half of tubes that depend on JI. And this is very suggestive an interpretation like this, where you have contributions that depend on the effective charge contributing between each operator. And that I would say suggests very strongly that the geometry breaks into this triangle-like picture. And this would be an example of something even more exotic, I would say, than a wormhole or a banana with three legs, which would be a donut with three legs. <clears throat> and uh, of course, more generally, it would be very interesting to just develop tools for doing computations in uh, gauge theory. And uh, so there's a lot to do. And in particular, I have postdoc positions in Brazil. So if you know good students that uh, for some reason still did not get uh, a position, I have definitely one, maybe two, perhaps even three positions to, to fill in. So I would be happy to know and talk to me in the break. Thank you. Questions? So uh, just a First, a quick comment about what might be useful terminology. Mm -hmm. um, if you decide you don't like talking about these internal boundaries for your banana in the gibbons hawking term, I think you can just as well say that you're doing the usual gravitational path integral, fixing the area of the black hole horizon. You can call these fixed area state calculations. You get exactly the same results. So it's a different perspective, a different terminology that might be useful. I see. And in that regard, I guess I'm tempted to ask, you know, your mm -hmm. results of computing these three-point OPEs, or I guess really the mod squared of the three-point OPEs for the wormhole calculation, you know, it's natural in the black hole case if you only are specifying that you have a black hole, perhaps of some area, which is like specifying, as we heard from you know, Tom Hartman, the uh, <coughs> uh, dimension of the primary or something, that you can't calculate just C, you can only calculate these mod C squares. But do you think it's possible that if you added more information somehow specifying more structure, that there might be a one-sided solution in the black hole regime that involves the three conical singularities actually meeting and intersecting? Yeah, so the short answer is that since this picture is matching the OZZ, and the OZZ should come from the bootstrap, I would be reluctant to touch it because it's already working. So I would just, but that's a cheap answer to say probably this is good. And it's good, the question is can we do better? Yeah, but it already gives the expected results from the modular bootstrap. So if you start finding new solutions that dominate over the ones that we found already that give the good DODZ, then we would be in trouble, I guess. Well, just before I finish, I'm not suggesting one find new things that dominate with the same boundary conditions. I'm suggest asking if we could specify additional constraints on the solution, effectively adding additional, if you like, additional boundary conditions at, at yeah. your internal boundary or specifying in a different way that would lead to a different you know, setting where you'd have different solutions. That's right, yeah. Or you could say, are there other identifications that outside this that G give the same thing, but as you go inside, they are single-sided? I have no theorem. That, that, I don't know if you were here when Tom gave uh, his talk or discussion during the program. I mean, I asked him exactly this question. How do we know that there are no solutions with one side on the black hole yeah. or with two sides with the defects? Uh, because the usual idea is once you make an ansatz like this Maldacena mouse, then you are guaranteed, but you are inputting a little bit that you have to say. So if you make already an ansatz that already injects that information, then uh, you get that information back. So I don't, it would be awesome to have a theorem that says it needs to be that at this mass, one quarter, there is a transition and you need to have two sides. And I, I don't know, I mean, well, yeah. 
when I asked, uh, yeah. It would be great, yeah. <clears throat> Hi. If we had uh, three particular operators, each of mass n squared, uh, would, would, is the expectation that the details of the operator don't matter in computing the three-point function? That all of them give the same answer? Depending only um, on their energy. So it's hard to answer, right? I mean, that's what we would like to answer. So for example, so for black holes, I don't know, because this, there are barely, st <laughs> there is maybe one state that people found that describes one black hole, right? You, you have almost no microscopic uh, description of these black holes in n equals four. But you could ask a toy model of that question, which would be if you take LLM geometries, there are many LLM geometries that could differ a little bit by changing the Young tableau a little bit. And now you could ask these questions. You could ask, I compute three operators with three Young tableaus. I change the Young tableau of one of them. How sensitive is the result? Is back reaction important? Can I ignore back reaction or not? Shot has a beautiful paper explaining that in some situations, back reaction is very important and the details matter. So this is exactly the kind of things that if we could set up this banana computation in gravity, we could predict the result, compute in gauge theory, see how universal it is, and see if perhaps the exponential is universal, but the order one prefactor is not. That's the most naive guess, but it could be something more exotic than this. So I just don't know. I mean, I would, I would need to have a control over the gauge theory, and for now, be beyond LLM, it's very hard. Any further questions? So in light of time, let's thank Pedro again.